thanks for tuning in. My name is Darby. I'm a genetic counselor and medical science liaison. I'm presenting an article out of Nephrology Dialysis Transplantation, which was published in uh, July 2021. This paper is a product of the European Renal Association, European Dialysis and Transplant Association Working Group on Inherited Kidney Disorders and the Molecular Diagnostic Task Force of the European Rare Kidney Disease Network. And it is entitled Genetic Testing and the Diagnosis of Chronic Kidney Disease, Recommendations for Clinical Practice. We know that there are well over 400 identified genes which cause kidney disease. Uh, massively parallel sequencing techniques have dramatically increased the affordability and accessibility of genetic testing across the board. Uh, so we're learning more and more about just how important the genetic underpinnings are in overall kidney disease causation. Um, but despite the many implications uh, that genetic testing results can have on prognosis management and counseling, there are still barriers to incorporating genetic testing for kidney disease into daily clinical practice. Uh, so so the goal of this paper is really to provide guidance uh, and support to uh, physicians to overcome these barriers and increase implementation of genetic testing uh, in routine nephrology practice. So the authors began with a basic description of genetic testing modalities and their applications. Uh, this table provides a summary uh, and includes the indications for which each method might be best utilized. Uh, Sanger sequencing is uh, not as commonly used in isolation. Um, uh, really, it's most appropriate when there is a high degree of suspicion for a condition that's uh, only known to be associated with a single gene. Uh, some specific examples would include uh, Febre disease or cystinosis. Array and MLPA technologies are used to detect copy number variants, uh, which are deletions or duplications of variable sizes. Uh, certain conditions uh, and specific genes are more likely to involve CNVs, including those associated with congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract. But mu much of the focus of this particular paper is on targeted panels. So those that only allow the sequencing of a set of pre-selected genes or uh, exome-based targeted panels. So um, are, where the entire uh, exome is sequenced, but only relevant genes are analyzed and interpreted. Uh, the authors differentiate these two approaches and, and highlight some positives and negatives of each. Uh, most notable is probably that with an exome backbone, you really do have more flexibility in terms of opening up to additional analysis of new genes or potentially even opening up the entire exome backbone if you wanted to reflex to a full exome uh, screening. They point out that there may be less uniform coverage with these uh, panels or um, uh, exomes, so you might need to supplement with Sanger fill-in or other uh, orthogonal methods in certain cases. So for both types of panels, you could potentially miss larger CNVs or certain variants within challenging regions unless you specifically prepared for that uh, with the analytics pipeline or confirmatory testing methods. When thinking about the larger scale approaches like full exome or full genome sequencing, a challenge is the risk for incidental findings uh, unrelated to the reason for testing. Uh, additionally, with genome sequencing, assessing and interpreting the implications of variants in those non-coding regions, which are assessed in genome sequencing, uh, but not exome sequencing, can be particularly challenging. And to that point, the authors spend some time discussing variants of uncertain significance, uh, as well as incidental or secondary findings, which they point out is really the most challenging questions um, around genetic diagnostics using uh, MPS, where so much data is generated. So we're all aware with variants of uncertain significance, uh, available evidence fails to significantly support either a pathogenic or neutral significance. Uh, policies on whether or not to disclose VUS to patients are extremely variable. So from institution to institution, provider to provider, or even from patient to patient. In the classification guidelines of the ACMG, it is recommended um, that VUS not be used for clinical decision making. And they advise that uh, we should be making efforts to resolve classification of VUS 
to either benign or pathogenic, uh, utilizing segregation analysis in families, functional studies, and data sharing, uh, but there's not a great deal of guidance really beyond that. And this paper doesn't provide much more of a directive other than to say that if the US are going to be reported, that clinicians should inform their patients of this, prepare them for the possibility of a VUS, uh, and uh, counsel them around the fact that additional studies might be necessary to help resolve any uh, VUS. Incidental findings are a bit different. Um, these are um, uh, situations you could encounter in either a whole exome or whole genome sequencing situation. So incidental findings are unanticipated findings that are really unrelated to the reason for testing, so in our setting unrelated to kidney disease. These findings may predict a risk for other disease types. Often this is related to cancers or cardiovascular disease, um, but the findings might be medically actionable um, with surveillance or treatment options. So there's ongoing debate and controversy uh, around how to handle these. Uh, ACMG has taken the approach of recommending a list of genes. Uh, there's now 73 uh, for which all likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants should be reported um, when we are doing exome or genome sequencing. Uh, in contrast, the European Society of Human Genetics and the uh, Canadian College is a bit more conservative. Uh, they really recommend sticking more with targeted panels with known disease um, uh, associations uh, versus uh, utilization of, of whole exome or whole genome. Throughout the paper, these authors really make a point of emphasizing the importance of clinical information in the interpretation of genetic diagnostic testing results. They advise that clinicians should provide as much information as possible related to medical history, renal symptoms, uh, age of onset, course of disease, physical exam, any kidney function tests, imaging, biopsy results, uh, and of course, any prior genetic testing results. Uh, they also suggest that family history be collected with a three generation pedigree. Uh, they discuss a few uh, newer tools, which are, are really quite interesting. Uh, the Examizer is a Java program that takes exome or genome sequencing data along with a set of phenotypic features uh, and filters and prioritizes variants from the um, sequencing data. So clinical information has to be presented in what, what's called HPO terms. This describes the phenotypic abnormalities. Uh, I visited the site. It's a very nice tool. But I understand that getting clinicians uh, to use HBO terms or to look those up uh, is, is, is a hurdle. So they are actually developing software um, to convert clinical or EMR notes to HPO. So uh, a lot of um, possibility on the horizon there. In terms of the clinical benefits of testing, uh, the authors hit on some major themes that really carry throughout each specific disease category that they discuss a bit later on in the paper. Uh, the first is that accurate diagnosis uh, via genetic testing is minimally invasive and could uh, end or prevent the diagnostic odyssey that so many patients go through, um, which in the case of CKD could include an invasive biopsy. Additionally, identification of an underlying condition can facilitate screening and early detection of any extra renal features, uh, which can be quite significant with some of these disorders, uh, and also inform more accurate prognosis regarding the progression of both a patient's kidney and extra renal disease. Uh, therapeutic decision making can be impacted by these results, possibly guiding clinicians to specific treatment options or preventing the prescription of ineffective therapies. In terms of genetic counseling, uh, knowledge obviously of a genetic diagnosis in a patient will inform recurrence risks for family members, reproductive uh, testing options, uh, and pre allow for pre-symptomatic testing opportunities for relatives. Uh, this could, in, in some cases, include assessment of related donor suitability, uh, particularly where uh, you know, the manifestations of disease may be age-dependent age or associated with a reduced penetrance. On the topic of genetic counseling, uh, the authors emphasize that counseling is important both in the pre and post test period and should definitely accompany diagnostic testing. Uh, they touch on some points that should be specifically covered in each of those uh, scenarios. So in the pre-test period, uh, in order to facilitate informed decision-making on the patient's part, uh, topics covered should include possible outcomes, 
and the implications or consequences of testing. These authors make a point that nephrologists uh, should be able to offer MPS-based testing to their patients. Uh, so presumably, these providers should be capable uh, of offering that pretest counseling as well. And the post-test period is recommended that, that patients be afforded a detailed discussion of their results, um, any associated disease, the prognosis, and recommendations for management based on those results. Uh, it's important to note that um, VUS uh, should not be used to make decisions regarding clinical management. It's also important um, for providers to discuss and encourage the sharing of information with family members who, uh, whose risk may be impacted by the genetic testing results. But the authors do um, specify that certain discussions and, and ordering situations um, maybe should be reserved for clinical genetics professionals. So that would include counseling regarding recurrence risk, reproductive options, um, as well as discussion or testing of at-risk relatives. In the presence of a negative result, it's also important um, for providers to be able to explain to patients that um, no testing can rule out the possibility of an underlying um, uh, genetic disease. So also an important part of the, the post-test counseling. So the information provided up to this point in the paper is applicable across genetic testing for different disease types, uh, but the authors do take the additional step of walking through some specific conditions and uh, considerations that should be taken into account when ordering genetic testing for those particular patients. Uh, monogenic contributions vary across different phenotypes and certain mutation types, uh, such as copy number variants, might play a bigger role in certain situations. So uh, they strive Stratify their recommendations for testing approach um, based on uh, disease type. And that's summarized here in the table on this slide. So in conclusion, um, the authors summarize that there is an enormous potential for MPS-based testing in patients with CKD. Uh, on the whole, phenotype-associated multigene panels and targeted exomes are going to be the preferred testing modalities. Uh, for, for the majority of patients, uh, but we do need to increase the awareness and evidence of benefits of genetic testing. Uh, this starts with improving genetic literacy among clinicians, uh, also improving our abilities to interpret genetic variants. Uh, this can be achieved through bioinformatics innovations and data sharing, as well as large-scale validation of uh, research findings. We also uh, need to uh, determine the cost versus benefits of uh, genetic testing, so uh, longer term studies are, are needed for that. Uh, and finally, we need to better understand how to effectively organize genetic testing and counseling uh, in daily clinical practice, uh, so um, developing support tools, um, uh, making sure that genetic counselors are available for nephrology uh, practices um, and identifying uh, centers of, of excellence and um, uh, practices that will uh, facilitate um, increased use and, and access to this information. Mm -hmm.